the reality of our sonship. Our minds are open in the name of Jesus. To the reality that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Alright. Now, obviously, now when I say sonship, you, you know, you may naturally wonder, what if you are not a boy? Right? Is it not natural? Okay. But, you know, because we are Christians, we don't have a question in our hearts that girls are not excluded simply because we say sons. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because, um, of course, the Bible says that in Christ, there is no gender. Okay? Um, because if you ask people in the world today, how many genders are there? Do, do we have a number? Do you have a number? I know at least, I know they will have at least have 50. 53. Thank you. Is, is he a static number or is he still growing? He's evolving. Okay, 53 plus. <laughs> you know, even the, even the LGBT community, you know, they have gotten tired. They have added plus at the back. LGBT. That was what we used to know. Now it became LGBTQ. But then, it, then you, they felt like they were excluding some people. They now had it plus. You see. So the, the, the world, you know, that was why we prayed this morning that the church will be a banner, a place where the banner of God's wisdom is lifted up. That the world does not infect us with the work virus. Rather, we show the wisdom of God to the nations. We show them the wisdom of God. That's why the Bible says that the intention of God in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 is that he wants to, through the church, display his manifold wisdom to principalities and powers in the heavenlies. In other words, what is the purpose of church? God is teaching his wisdom, not just to humans, but to the principalities behind them. So you need to get tired of going to church to go and learn about greatness. And now that you'll be great in your business, you'll be tall and you have money and have stuff. That is not what the church is meant for. And I'm telling you, church is not meant for such things. I taught you here in one of our Thursday services that what is the purpose of work? To provide your own necessities and those that are around you. Hello? God did not invent work for you to acquire wealth. Did you hear me? Eh? You say, but does God not want us to have wealth? I did not say that. Right? I didn't say that. What did I say? The purpose of work is not to acquire wealth. No, that's not the purpose of work. The purpose of work is to provide your necessities and for those that you support. Glory be to Jesus. But can wealth come out of work? Yes. It is subject to the value, the kind of value you provide. Do you see what I'm saying now? So you can, you can find wealth alongside work. But that is not the motive of work. Glory be to Jesus. When God gave Adam work in the garden, it was not to accumulate wealth. I hope you know that. Uh -huh. It was not to accumulate wealth. Everything he would have needed was already provided. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I showed you in the New Testament. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, you saw all of that. The purpose, primary purpose of work is to what? Provide your necessities. Glory be to Jesus. So that is not what church is meant for. And quit you thinking like ordinary men. Because if you think that you go to church so that you can be blessed, so that your life can go well, you can have money, you can have job, you can have business that is thriving and all that, then you are mistaken. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. We, we have gone past that one. Eh? Have you gone past it? Uh -huh. Glory be to Jesus. So, sonship. And I told you, does not exclude females. Okay? Alright. Now, the idea that someone could be a son of God did not even start with the New Testament. I, that, you know, I like to start my own lessons from the basics. Okay? Uh, 
the idea that you could be a son of God. I will always use son. So don't, I'm not discriminating against female. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Now, so the idea that somebody can be a son of God did not originate with the New Testament. It's not a, it's not a language that started in the New Testament. No. It started f as far back in the very origins of creation. And I want to show you examples of that. The first time the, the idea of the Son of God was communicated in the Bible was in Genesis chapter 6. You, so you have to open your Bible. And like we always do, you will read some of them. So you have to open your Bible. And if you don't want me to burn time, you have to do it fast. So that I'm not waiting for you all the time. All right. Genesis chapter 6. Are you there now? I'm going to read. In fact, we can just simply read from verse 1 to uh, probably 4. But I'll read. I'll show you the verses I want you to read together with me. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Who are the people growing on the face of the earth? Men. Men is to tell you they are what? Human beings. Are you following what I'm saying? Okay. Verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. <laughs> the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. You know, fair is the Old Testament language for beautiful. Okay? So, these sons of God, whoever they were, saw the daughters of men that they were very beautiful. And what did they do? They picked wives. So, these sons of God, whoever they were, they knew fine things. Oset, ole. What other language do we use nowadays? Somewhere le. You know, you know <laughs> Yoruba has a way of denigrating things that are very fine. <laughs> I'm, nah, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I like your language, but I'm not denting the language. I'm just saying, how can you call something? You know, say, something that is beautiful, you know, say, oh, more le. <laughs> eh? <laughs> eh? <laughs> moi, moi, <ni>. <laughs> so they saw these girls, fine girls, and they were like, no, this beauty will not pass me by. I must choose one. So they started marrying them. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Can we read verse 4 together? One, two, go. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Look at it. It says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after. But what happens immediately? It says, why, what, why did they have giants in those days? It says, the sons of God came to the daughters of men and they had children by those women. Now, have you heard this before? Anyone? This before? Now, if I ask you, those of you that have not heard, who would you call these sons of God? What would you say? Those who have not heard. Those who have not heard. Angels, thank you. Any other one? Any other opinion? What will you call them? Angels. And you said you have not heard it before. You are all calling it angels. I expect different, different opinion. Any other one? Eh? Taiwo, you want to say something? No. No other opinion. You don't, want, you, you don't have an opinion. You are... You be, uh, yes. Falling angels, okay? Well, whether falling or standing, angels, Right? That's the underlining thing, okay? But it, now, saying falling, it, it, it does have relevance, okay? But the bottom line here is what? 
angels. Why did you come to the conclusion that they are angels? They are not human beings. How did you know they were not human beings? The, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Okay. It's disparity between them. Okay. Maybe you wanted to say something. Mr. Bobadoy. You said something now. What? You don't want to say it again. Glory be to Jesus. Now, if he was talking about... Now, I'm using your logic. If he was talking about the same people, what is the point of putting disparity between them? Why would he say the sons of God came to the daughters of men if they were of the same kind? That's your logic, right? Am I expressing your logic? Glory be to Jesus. Now, now, it says, it gives us the sense that something was going on here. Eh? Yeah, something was going on here. It calls them the sons of God. Now, if you have read other books, it is most likely you will come to that conclusion that they are angels. Other books that are not in the Bible. Okay? Or you have heard somebody talk about it. But, let us look at it just within the context of the Bible alone. You know me, I'm a Bible person. And you are a Bible person too, right? Uh, you are Bible people, okay? Go to um, Job chapter 1. You know, if the identity of the sons of God in this chapter 6 is shrouded in mystery, we can, ap we can appeal to other passages you know, to try to unravel these personalities. Job chapter 1, and we're going to read uh, verse, well, maybe I'm going to read it from verse 1, but my verse of interest is actually verse 6. My verse of interest is 6. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. That's ten children. His substance was also 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 5,000 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. Said Job in his time was the greatest. So this was their fourth list of their time. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. How many of you have seen four lists before? Do, do you read the reports? Or you just read the list? If you read the reports, they will tell you how they came to the valuation of who they call the richest man in the world, right? They will show you how they came to the conclusion that is the richest man in the world. So for this writer to conclude that he was the greatest of the men from the east, he gave us a list of his assets. Verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses. Everyone is day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone, were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them, or de of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So Job was a type that does not like sin around him. In his family, he doesn't want to hear sin. So he would always make sacrifices of atonement for his children just in case they had sinned. Now, look at verse 6. Can we read together? One, two, go. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, verse 7 now, Whence cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Can you see? Now, here, who will you call the sons of God to? Angels. You? Angels. 
Everybody agree? Spiritual beings, okay? Are there other spiritual beings apart from angels? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. Are there entities other than angels? Spiritual beings? Now, I don't want you to answer it. Let me leave it for now. <laughs> because we will not get into the meat of the lesson until the next session. Okay? This one, I just want to open your mind to the idea of sonship. Okay? Now, look at it. It says, The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. Why would Satan be there? Is it possible that he was one of the sons of God? Or he used to be one of the sons of God? Are, are, are we following? So you see that, why would they call them sons? Why? Why? They call them sons. Whoever they are, these people are, they call them, or these personalities, these beings, they call them sons. Now, we find a definite character among them to show us an example of the kind of beings they were. That now it is becoming clearer that these guys are not human beings. Are you following what I'm saying? They are not humans like us. Because it says, Satan came among them. Now, this seemed like going on in the spiritual realm while Job was living his life normally on the head. You see? So you see the idea of God, the sons of God, communicated again. Are you following? All right. Let's go on. Now, <clears throat> if this is not yet clear, okay? If you, you, know, you know the story of Job, right? And then the misfortune happened to him, those misfortunes, and Job thought that there is no, nothing he has done wrong that, he would have, that would have warranted all the calamities that befell him. And then he, was, he, you know, he went into a state of mourning. And then his friends came to mourn with him. And there were these dialogues. Can, can we call them dialogues? There, there were like three friends that came. And they had this conversation back and forth about whose, rest, whose fault it was, all the things that happened to Job. All his friends felt that Job had sinned. That there was a sin in the life or sins in the life of Job that brought all those calamities into his life. But Job raised up his hand up and said, no. If there is a sin in my life, let God come up and come and tell me what sin it is. Remember what we read. Anytime his children go feasting, they go partying, Job will not rely on the common, sensi, common, the common sensibility of his children to act right. When they come back from their parties, what will he do? Sacrifices. To show you that he was not the type that tolerated sin. Do you understand? So he, was, he asked a lot of questions of his friends and he was pointing, you know, his conversation was pointing in the direction of God. God needs to answer a question. God asked a question to answer in this regard. I did not do anything wrong. In fact, when they accused him of infidelity, he said, me, that I have sworn that I will never look at a woman lustfully in my life. I sworn with my eyes. <laughs> do, you, do, you know, do, you, do you know those kind of guys? He said, me. <laughs> No, there are some people, their, their minds are not yet very mature. There is a joke I would, have, I would have said, but it's very gross, so I will not say it. I will just keep. <laughs> but he would have painted the image of what, what this is vividly to you. But it's too gross, so I will, I will skip it. Amen. Amen. Now, because there are some people, they are so, I mean, they are upbringing, they are so, they are so much in the dark, darkness of, the, of exploring their humanity. That they grew up into adulthood very ignorant. They have not really explored their sensuality. I'm deliberately sounding like that. You know, they, are, they have not explored their, their, their sensuality. So, you know, those kind of guys or ladies, 
you know, there are some things you say before them. You two won't make any difference. They just move on. Like, what are you saying? I don't understand. I don't even like the way you talk. They don't want to be, they don't want to have conversation with you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Eh? Even if you don't understand, leave it like that. I just <laughs> anyways. So that job was that righteousness conscious, of course, self-righteous. Okay. Very self-righteous. Because he never really looked at the righteousness that God provided. Of course, too, you must also understand that maybe that was the extent of the revelation that he had. Okay, so it's not like blaming Job for being like this, okay? But when God eventually showed up, God did. God showed up and told him, I'm going to come and I'm going to answer your questions, Job. And I, but before I answer your question, I'm going to ask you some questions and you're going to answer me. So let's go to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. <clears throat> so God pops up right before Job <laughs> and then began to then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness counsel by words without knowledge? He's, he's rebuking his friends that have been speaking to Job. They are, they are darkening counsel. He says, They are speaking words without knowledge. You know, <laughs> people can be using words and there's no knowledge in it. Hello? People can be using words. And the Bible says, God says there is no knowledge in it. No knowledge. Get up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer. I will demand of thee an answer thou me. Verse 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth. Declare if thou hast understanding. Uh -huh. You are challenging God. God says, can you tell me if you were there, when I laid the foundations of the earth, can you, can you describe to me how I did it? <laughs> can you describe to me how I laid the foundations of the earth? Look at verse 5. Who had laid the measures thereof? If thou knowest or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations of, thereof fastened? That is, where is the foundation of the heart attached to? You know, this house now is attached to the ground. But the earth itself, where is it attached to? You know, it's just a planet floating around, right? Science helps us to know that today, right? It's floating around. But nothing is holding it to the ground. It's not attached to any ground. And, you know, storm has not come one day to blow it away, of course. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Can we read verse 7 together? One, two, go. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So what is God describing here? If you continue to read it, what is he describing? The story of creation. The story of creation. But strangely, in the middle of this story, it talks about these sons of God again. He said, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, we cannot build doctrine on one verse of the Bible, right? You know that. But what this seems to suggest is that these personalities, these beings were present before the creation of humankind. Are you following what I'm saying? Because he's describing the creation of the earth. And then he's already talking about the sons of God singing together and shouting for joy. Do you see? So, you always find this expression uh, in the Old Testament describing the sons of God. In fact, I jumped over Job chapter 2, verse 1. There was a second meeting when God conveyed, God convened a meeting, convened a meeting, and then they came again. And Satan was in their midst again. That is in Job chapter 2, verse 1. In addition to the one we read in Job chapter 1, verse 6. You see that now. So these sons of God have, have always been around. They were referred to by biblical writers as sons of of God. So, if you bring, if you, just for a moment, bring it into the New Testament, and you hear the Son of God, it should not be strange. 
Are you following what I'm saying? Because, you know, there are people who build their religion on the fact that God does not have a son. Simply because they want to attack the deity of Jesus. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Uh Because they want to attack the deity of Jesus, they just say God, they don't want to hear it. God does not have a son. But the truth is that Jesus was not the first person. Biblical writers deemed the son of God. I don't know if you get it. Now, the level of sonship may differ, but he was not the first one they called the son of God. There were other spiritual entities that were regarded by biblical writers as sons of God. So you did see that when God showed up to answer Job's many questions, in the process he spoke about the presence of the sons of God at creation. Um, so I, I, had, I have a fun fact in my notes. I just want to leave, leave that one to you. The writer of Genesis, Moses, used the term sons of God in Genesis in describing a group of characters in the pre-flood world. Now, that's... That, you know, using that expression, sons of God, we credit it to Moses, who started it, right? Uh-huh. But the term was used in Job. The writer this time, quoting God in his speech in response to Job. Now, do you get what I'm trying to say? In Genesis, who used the term? Moses. In Job, who used the term? Now, that's the tricky part. Eh? God used it. Even though the writer quoted God verbatim. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Uh-huh. It wasn't the writer that wrote it that described them as the sons of God. It was God that spoke and called them the sons of God. Do you get it now? Mm-hmm. Alright, so if you say go- Moses was the one that called them sons of God in Genesis 6, how do you deal with the one and if you say the writer of Job was the one that used the term in Job 1 and Job 2. What about Job 38? When he, in this case, he is quoting God to have called them the sons of God. Do you get, do you get my point? Uh-huh. All right. When you don't answer me, I'm wondering, do you understand at all? Eh? Okay. <clears throat> so, let's move on. And the time appear again in the Old Testament yet again. This time around, it does not use the plural, sons. It uses son of God. In Daniel chapter 4, or chapter 3 rather. Let's go there. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to read verse 25. This is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were, because they refused to bow to the uh, image of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, they were bound and thrown into a fiery furnace. Now, so, now, they have been thrown into the furnace. Okay? Verse 25. All verse 24 and 25. Let's read 25 and 25 together. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and, ar- and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. That is, we threw three men into the fire. Verse 25, he answered, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking now, and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fort is like the Son of God. He says, the fourth man, the fourth man, the fourth man, the fourth man. Now, there were only three thrown into the fire. All of a sudden, there is a fourth man in the fire. He says, the fourth man has the appearance of the Son of God. And don't be mistaken. In many uh, polytheistic civilizations, the idea of sons of God or gods having children was not strange. Many of them in their legends, in their myths, have these gods having wives. 
that have children. Now, if you read a bit of Greek mythology, you understand what I'm saying. Right? They have children. In fact, if you read in the Old Testament, you, you find this, um, um, there is, I mean, you will not find this directly in the Bible. You'll find the gods mentioned in the Bible, but you'll not find the background story in the Bible. So it's not important, okay? But I just want to mention it to you, but just as an aside. You see, they are, one of their primary gods was someone called, called Hell. You know, for instance, you know, in, in, those languages are from the same area, the same foundational, you know, principles. So, you know, for instance, the, one of the terms for God in the Old Testament is Elohim. Okay? So, they have this primary God they call Hell. Hell, E-L, has a wife called Ashtoreth. And together they have children. One of them was Baal. So, if you read your Old Testament, you find Baal a lot that the children of Israel worshipped and God judged them for. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, they, 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 and if you go through other civilizations, they, have, they all have an idea of their gods having children. So, it's not strange. But for him to now come here to say they fought man as the appearance of the Son of God, he was not drunk. I hope you know he was not drunk. Uh -huh. He was not drunk. He was sober. He was sober. And here, it is singular because there was only one extra person in the fire. There were three that were thrown into the fire, but how many did he find in the fire? Four. So he is only accounting for just one person. So he says, the son of God. So the idea of sonship, that God having children, it's not strange. And it's simple. The only reason they call them son. I mean, the Bible did not really explain, but, it's, but we can simply just deduce that it was because they could not just unravel. I mean, they knew that they were, they, they had the concept of angels, people acting on behalf of God. So they simply called them what? The children of God. Do you get what? It's, it's just as simple as that. Oh, they came from God. God sent him to bring you a message. What do you call him? The children of God, the son of God. You see, God, he, he brings a message to you. It's an angel. He appears in their room. In the Old Testament, if you read most of the stories, what do they do? They want to worship the angels until the angels say no. You worship God. You see, because the honor they would have given to God, they would want to confer on his representatives. Are you following what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So sons of God are not an invention or is not an invention of the New Testament. The idea started from the Old Testament. So don't feel, don't feel it strange that, or don't feel challenged. If somebody, you know, wants to attack the deity of Christ, the sonship of Christ, that how come, Christ, how, how come you say Christ is the son of God? God does not have a wife. You should have no, you, you, in fact, that's why you should learn your Bible so that you are able to defend it. You are able to defend it. Because at the end of this lesson, where this points at is that if you believe a Christ that is not the Son of God, you are not a Christian. I, I, are you following what I'm saying? If you believe a Jesus Christ, if a Jesus Christ, that, the Jesus Christ that has been presented to you is not the Son of God, you have believed a false Christ. You are, you are not a child of God. You are still in your sin. And you will be judged for it. Because the idea of Christ is that Christ is the Son of God. That is the understanding New Testament writers gave us. Glory be to Jesus. All right. All right, so let's, 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 let's move. Now, there were other times this particular expression was not used, but the idea of God identifying some people as children was vividly communicated. Now, I said, there were other times in the Bible they did not use the term 
son of God. But the idea was communicated in that God referred to some people as his children. Or the people referred to God as their father. In the Old Testament, not in the New. Old. So, I just want to show you a background. That, you know, because, for instance, if you deal with a Muslim, if you preach to a Muslim, what they will tell you is that God did not give birth to anybody. Nobody gave birth to God, and God did not give birth to anybody. That's what they will tell you. So they, they are attacking, what they are doing is they are attacking the deity of Christ. They want to disconnect Jesus Christ from God. And if they do that, the Christ that we have believed will be a false one. But if you go back to your Bible, you will see that in the Old Testament, they even called people, ordinary people, that were born by a man and a woman, children of God. God referred to people as his own children. So why should he now become all of a sudden strange in the New Testament because that term is now applied to somebody that was born of a woman without a man? I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So let's look at a few examples. Exodus chapter 4. This is God speaking to Moses to redeem the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 4. I'm going to read, I think, verse 22 and 23. Exodus 4, verse 22 and 23. Look at what it says. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. <coughs> Who is the son of God here? Israel. Is it your son? Firstborn. Firstborn. Who ended up with that firstborn title in the New Testament? Jesus. Of course, the sense is different. Here, firstborn simply means the first. Number one. The one that was the one out of many. Okay. Yes, the first nation. First, the number one. is the one that comes first. Ahead of others. But in the New Testament, it carries more than first. Number one. It carries type. Type. Just like Adam was a type of creation, Christ is a type of creation. Well, that creation is, is a dilution. <laughs> you know? Because Christ is not a creation. He is of God. Now, there is no, I don't know a better way to say it. Christ is simply of God. Okay? It's just like when you find, in the, the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. But in verse 2 it says, the spirit of God over the, over the surface of the deep. Why did he introduce the spirit of God in verse 2? Why not the same God over the, over the surface of the deep? I don't know if you get what I'm saying. These are things you can just look at and say, ah, could make sense now. Why will he change the terminology? Why did he move from verse 1, God created. Verse 2, the spirit of God. It could have stayed with God, right? Now, is that spirit different from God? And it's the same way if God would do anything on the earth. Will he go there? Will he go there? Will he get down from heaven and go there? How will he do it? By his spirit. Do you see that now? So you, you need to understand the way the Bible writers speak, communicate the idea of God. You see. So they, and they use these terms interchangeably. Sometimes they will say God. Other times they will say the spirit of God. You see that now? Does it diminish the person of God? No. All right. So it's the same thing when you say uh, Christ. He is of God. That's why he said, I am from the bosom of the Father. Because there is no better way to, exp there is no better way to express it. You see. Because the relationship they have is not, not that you can divide them. 
You can't. And the only form of um, the only form of the only form of separation. Now you know I'm speaking like a human being. Now I'm speaking human language because the only form of separation you can have between God and Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ became a man. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Now if he is not a man, he will be no different from God. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So look here now. He calls Israel God's son. God's firstborn. Do you understand that? All right, let's move on. Deuteronomy chapter 14. We're going to run through this ones. Chapter 14, verse 1. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel. We are going to read this one together. You know where Deuteronomy is now. You have to know. Ye are the children. Can we go now? Are we all there? One, two, go. Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. So you see some people in their tradition, they have some rituals they have to perform. When, when, they, when someone dies in their family, it's a ritual. God says, mm -mm, you are a child of God. You must not do that. Do you know that, <laughs> have you heard stuff like, you know, we are, most of us here are Yoruba people, have you? All of us are Yoruba. No, not all of us. Now, have you heard some people say, Orole? Oroidile? You've heard it before. Oroidile? Oro, eh? What do you call it? Oroidile? Oroile? Eh, same thing. Now, there are rituals people have in their families that you will laugh when you hear or some. In some families, they are a gungu family. A gungu. Where they will carry masquerade and they have yearly rituals they must do. Right? There are some families like that. There are some, Igun, in Lagos, for instance, many of them from Lagos Island, is Igunuko. You know that tall thing? That very tall, wearing white um, masquerade. Um, is Agere, thank you. You know? Very tall stuff. And they must go there, service it, and do it every year. You see? So people have stuff they do in their family. In, in fact, there are some, they will tell you that in their family, they don't eat any draw soup. Have you heard stuff like that before? They don't eat any draw soup. Me, I don't, I don't like draw soup. Oh. It's just because I don't like it. Uh, I usually don't eat it until my... You know, if, when, you now have, when you're married, eh? You know, there are some things you do for love. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> no, uh, anything my wife says, ah, you don't tell your wife it's not delicious. You're in soup. <laughs> Even if it's not sweet, you eat it like that. <laughs> It's funny. But I, I, you know, I, I abandoned eating draw stuff for a very, very long time. You know? But my wife likes to eat it. So, what she typically do is that she will put vegetable in the draw soup so that I can eat it. <laughs> and she will say it is weird. So, she does not like to eat that with me. So, she will make her own and separate it and put vegetable in mine. Because the idea of eating something that is that drawy, I don't like it. <laughs> But it's not orally. Yes. I just don't like it. Do you see that now? I just don't like it. So, but people have family traditions. You know, in some cultures, yam is a big deal. And nobody will eat their yam or harvest their yam until the new yam festival. Abi, East people, they do it now. So many traditions that people have. So it's just like that. They cut themselves for the dead. All these rituals, Moses told the children of Israel, never, ever do them because you are the children of God. Do you see that? Why would they not do it? They are children of God. So I don't expect you to go and say you are doing Uruli. You know, when we were growing up, it was very common. And the way people participated, Christians, I'm talking about Christians, I'm talking to you as Christians. The way Christians participated is that they will not go for the festival, but they will send money. They will not say, ah, well, but the truth is that you put your money where your mouth is. Do you get it? You put your money where your mouth is. I heard that my grandfather, in his days, masquerade did not pass by, pass through the front of his house. 
when they are going for their procession, they will bypass his house. They will go and use the back road, <laughs> back road and then cross out. They will not pass the front of his house. He made his stance known. No. I know the world is more tolerant nowadays though. But then, you can live your life without participating in this kind of rituals. Do you understand? Why would you not participate in the rituals? Because you are the children of God. Do you get it now? That was exactly what Moses to- taught these people. Do you, does it go back to back with what we learn in the New Testament? Eh? You see, why would Paul teach in 1 Corinthians that you must not eat things sacrificed to idols? You know, we have the liberty to eat anything we want. The Bible says it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. That's what the Bible says. It is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. But then, in the same breath, he says, I do not want you to participate in the same tables with idols. But they bring Sarah's food to you. You eat. You say, ah. But the, the Bible that says um, food does not commend us to God. Whether if we eat, whether if we eat, are we, uh, how, how, how is that? Now? Food does not commend us to God. Whether we eat, are we the better? Or if we eat not, are we the worse? Now, that does not now give you the liberty to eat food sacrificed to idol because it's the same Bible that now says that I don't want you to participate in food sacrificed to idols. Do you understand? So you cannot use that as liberty to eat Sarah. You know what they call Sarah now? I don't know what they call What, what we call it in, in English? What we call Sarah in English? <laughs> she said sacrifice eh? you know and that's what it is, a sacrifice but you ate it now, what makes it a sacrifice it has been devoted to an idol but you, you just carry it and began to eat it ah, ah. no, I trust the, I trust the best of you, you don't eat those kind of stuff you go, you go on the road you now saw this calabash. You now start with it. And you started eating it. Eh? You now sit down with it. You draw it close and you begin to eat. Or echo and palm oil. Eh? You know what they call echo? Have you seen it before? Pap. The dry one. You now inside. Or a kuru. Yes. You call it. You, you, what's a kuru? You do. A kuru is a kuru. <laughs> you now take a kuru, you now put my money by the side, and you eat. You see. No, it's the same. The difference is that they brought this one to your house. The other one, they put it on the street. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the only difference. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. You cannot, you are not of that stock. Why? Because you are a child of God. Do you understand? I said, but I have Muslims in my family now. Ah, okay. Are you not a pilgrim and stranger in this world? Eh? If they know you, you wear your identity like a garment. Nobody will bring it to you. I hope you know. It gone are those days when, when people are distributing those kind of stuff during their annual sacrifices. They will bypass your house. They won't bring it. Say, ah, no, I want a Christian anymore. But there are other Christians that will take it. So those ones, they are Christians. You know. But others will take it. I remember there was a guy that, a consultant that did some stuff for my office, some not so clean stuff. Many years, many, many years ago. This guy, after he had finished the work, he had delivered it. Out of the proceeds that he got from the business, came to say thank you to everybody in the office. So he was sharing part of the logis to everyone that knew about the transaction. So, he, he was going office to office. I, I, I heard him going from one office to other. And I, I saw him enter, enter soon. So, he came into mine also. I don't know if I was the last person. And then, he came to offer me money, obviously. And I told him that, no, I don't want it. That uh, no, He can keep it. That, uh, I, don't just, I, that I just did my job. And he has done his. He was compensated for the, his job. There is no reason why he should give me out of his money. You know when he was leaving? When he was leaving, as he was going out, 
He said, ah, you, you are a Christian. When he was walking out, that was what he said. You, you are a Christian. But I was not the only Christian in the office. In fact, I think in the entire organization, I think there was only one Muslim there. So everyone he gave the money to, they were Christians. But when he was leaving, he said, you, you are a Christian. That was what he said. Meaning that even people can distinguish between, you know, you know I told you earlier, by your actions, we can tell the state of your heart. Whether your, whether your heart is devoted to God, we will know in the things you do and in the things you say. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 31 Verse 9. You can do your own study and pick out your own examples too. More examples. Jeremiah 39, verse 1. Look at it. They shall come with weeping and with supplication will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. What did I read? Jeremiah 31 9. Yes, 31 9. You open 39. I said 39. I'm sorry. 31. I said 39, but I opened 31. <laughs> Jeremiah 31, verse 9. All right. Hosea 11. Hosea 11, verse 1. You see, it's a common thing. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. In fact, this particular verse was quoted uh, when Jesus came out of Egypt. Same book, Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Look at what it says. Ye, yet, ye, yet the number... Of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Can you see that now? Where it was said to you that you are not the children of God, the same place. It will be said unto you that you are the sons of the living God. Do you see that now? Now, look at um, Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. I am going to read verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 43, verse 6 and 7. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar. And my daughters from the hands of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yeah, I have made him. You see that? This is God speaking. He says, I will call them forth from every side they are. They are. You see that? I will call them forth. Alright. Now, there is one that... Um, my opinion is always moving back and forth on this one, Psalm 82. I don't know where my opinion is now, but look at it, Psalm 82. I'm going to read verse 6 and 7. Psalm 82. I'm going to read verse 6 and 7. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. And fall like one of the princes. Hallelujah. Generally, um, this is a psalm that, you know, in my, my, I think my first lesson on this passage, I, I, would, reg, I would rigidly apply it to um, a conversation beyond earthly realms. You, exclusively. But after <laughs> some, some years have passed by now, I will say, I would not be so, so rigid. Okay, I will not be so rigid to think that it is simply about uh, the spiritual realm. I will say it can also apply to men because uh, 
that term Elohim, generally, if you look at the very first verse, sometimes it's also used for judges, human judges, okay? As well as it can be used for God, the Most High God. And it can also be used for gods, okay? It can also be used for gods. Uh, so, the context will determine what it is meant for. And typically, uh, if you remember some time ago, I told you about the principle of double reference. That the passage can refer to two or more things. Okay? Um, so, it, it has a sense in which you can apply it to humans, and it has a sense in which you can apply it to spiritual beings. Because look at, just like the logic you used in Genesis chapter 6, it is also present in verse 6 here. Can we read it again? One to go. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. But read verse 7. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now, if these were human beings, what is the point of saying they shall die like men? They are already men. They will die anyways. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Uh, you, you language people, I, I don't know what kind of... Yes, true. In fact, Jesus quoted this directly. Jesus quoted this directly, you know. So, so and when, it, when Jesus quoted it, <laughs> Jesus pointed it directly at men. He was speaking to men. He pointed it at them. So, um, it, 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 my mind is always going back and forth on it. But the point here is this. It, there are other people, people that are called the children of God. Whether spiritual or natural, people are called the children of God. Do you get the point now? Okay. And in fact, on the side of the people, they also acknowledge God as Father. So there were other times that people acknowledge God as Father. So let's take two examples. One in the Old Testament and one in the New. In the Old Testament, let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah, chapter 63, verse 16. Isaiah 63, verse 16. Did I say 16? Yes, 16. Doubtless, thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer, Thy name is from everlasting. Do you see that? And in the New Testament, John, so this is the people speaking of God. Look at John chapter 8, verse 41 and 42. John chapter 8, verse 41 and 42. Ye do the deeds of your father. Can you see? This is Jesus speaking. Ye did do the deeds. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him. So they are responding to Jesus. Where am I? <laughs> Verse 41. Then said, they, then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. They are speaking to Jesus. Who, whom they did not accept is sonship from God. But they have the temerity to claim that they are from God. Can you see hypocrisy? You cannot be the son of God as long as it is you. But if it is me, I am the son of God. You, no. Me, yes. As if you have the monopoly of identity. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it's just like sometimes when we, when we look at the ancient world, you know, today, that your life in Christ is a leveler. Everyone in Christ is determined to be a child of God. But in the old times before Christ, you know, there is this arrogance that comes with the Jews that God is exclusive to them. You, you know, they, you, say, you see the sense in their writing in their way of life, in their culture, they have this arrogance that they have God 
to themselves exclusively. But I always ask that question. Where did Melchizedek get the idea of the Most High God? He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Jew. So where did he get the idea of God from? How come he knew God? And Abraham acknowledged his high standing before God by paying him a tithe. Do you see that now? So, and in fact, the priesthood of Christ in the New Testament, if you read in the Hebrews, is patterned after the priesthood of Melchizedek, a man who is not even a Jew. Do you see that now? Where did he get the knowledge of God? What about Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses? Where did he meet God? So you see, the idea of God came to the much of the much of the world through the Jews, but God is not an exclusive of the Jews. Are you following what I'm saying? They were the ones God authorized to give us the scriptures through whom the Christ would come. Because that's why we are not looking for Christ in any other place. Okay? And that's why we accepted the scriptures that God gave to them. Ukrain and Sinka. You see? Because they were authorized by God to do it. You see? But it does not in any way now say that they have exclusive access to God. That's not true. Because even the Old Testament has record of people who did not descend from the from Abraham line that knew God. I mean, I mean, Abraham was the start, was the one that started the race. And in fact, not everyone that Abraham gave birth to are called Jews, right? Uh -huh. so, and Abraham paid homage to Melchizedek and recognized him as the priest of God. Do you get my point now? All right. I just answered myself so that I, <laughs> I answered myself on your behalf. <laughs> Amen. All right, so that is clear, right? So we see it from both sides. God referred to people as his children, and the people also acknowledged God as father. In fact, this one in John chapter 8, for instance, even though they were lying, you know, they were lying, they lied right before Jesus. They lied that God was their father. And Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would have loved me. Can you imagine today, in today's world, two Christians, so they will fight each other and sue themselves to court. In fact, sometimes from the same church, from the same church, they now drag each other to police station. Police station. And maybe the, the, the police station will not say, go and bring your pastor. Maybe you <laughs> go and bring your pastor. You now denigrate, you denigrate your pastor, denigrate the church of God, before infidels. No, that's not good enough. So it's, so, it's not strange that God has children and that uh, people also acknowledge God as father. So the idea of God having a son is, son is not strange at all. Um, and usually, the idea will become strange when people want to excuse, they want to excuse away the revelation of God. Like I gave you the ex explanation of uh, the people of other faiths, the other faiths. You know, when they say, uh, uh, God did not give birth. Eh? God did not give. He has no, nobody gave birth to him and he did not give birth to anyone. You see. So they excuse away the revelation of God simply because they want to keep a dogma that they were given. Do you understand? Eh? And usually, and if you pay attention to what Dimeji shared with us, you will realize that. That usually, you take a truth and you, 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 you reject one about God. See, at the end of the day, you are as ignorant. And sometimes, it might just simply be, as a Christian, I'm talking about as, as a Christian now, it might, just be, you might, it might just be that you have believed the wrong one. So, whether the truth must always stay in your face. 
whether it knocks down what you have believed for, you know, years, it doesn't really matter. The truth is the truth. It has no sides. You know, the truth is not looking at your face or your face or your face to determine whose side to be on. The truth is the truth. It's telling everybody in the same, from the same angle. And we must all bend and yield to the truth. Glory be to Jesus. So, spiritual entities were called the sons of God. And in the same manner, men were so labeled. All right. Now, if you come into the New Testament, the announcement of the conception of Jesus introduced the terminology to us uh, at the beginning of, at the commencement of the new era. Uh, look at it. Luke chapter 1. I don't know how much time I can use to say this. Okay, Luke chapter 1. Look at it. Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive. This is the angel, um, Gabriel, speaking to um, Mary. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Can you see that now? He shall be called what? The son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Look at verse 34. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called what? The Son of God. Can you say that now? What will be born of you will be called what? The Son of God. Now this is specific to a person. Now so far you see that this idea did not originate here. Okay? And uh, the you, you will see the uniqueness of this particular song we are talking about now. Now, we've seen how it is used generically for spiritual entities, for human entities. We've seen that. But now, this term is used specifically for a person. A person. One person. And it says, this person will be conceived of the Holy Ghost and it will be called the Son of the Most High. The Son of God. Alright. And at the start of the ministry of Jesus... Satan came up to te tempt him, testing him in his standing as the son of God. That is very instructive. When Satan came to test Jesus, he tested his identity as the son of God. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 4. Or Luke chapter 4 too. It can be Luke, anyone. Since I'm in Luke, so I'll stay with Luke. Luke chapter 4. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, from verse 1, returned from Jordan and was led up, led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. How many days was he tempted? Eh? So don't think because... He was tempted. The temptation that was recorded were three. Meant he was tempted three days. He was tempted continually. For how many days? Forty days. And now, imagine that he had not eaten. You, you fasted. They just told you to fast till six. By the time it is twelve, your face has become pale. You are hungry. You are, you are hungry and angry. <laughs> A double-edged sword. Mark honey. Anyone that comes across your path at this point, you stab. Straight. They get a piercing of your hunger. <laughs> Woto, <-to. laughs> 
Glory. <laughs> eh? Just because you have not eaten breakfast. Ah, uh, uh, bro, sis. Tell your neighbor, calm down. Tell your neighbor, calm down. And I hope you have been fasting. Because none of you have asked me permission. And if you have not fa- if you did not fast and you did not ask my permission, what have you done? You have sinned. Says who? Me. So if you if you don't fast and you did not tell me, you did not seek my permission not to fast. It is in this church, in this one. You can go elsewhere and they tell you to not to fast. To disobey your pastor is uh, not a sin. Here, if you do that, it's a sin. I'm t- here, I'm telling you it's a sin. So when I tell you to fast, what must you do? Fast. Okay. So it was, Jesus did his own for 40 days. So was it legitimate to be hungry? Okay. Verse 3, And the devil said, un, said to, unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. What is he challenging? His sonship. If you are a son of God, command this stone to be turned to bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil will not stop. Verse 5. And the devil taketh him up into an high mountain, shewed him, taking him up into an high mountain, shewed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for it is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him shalt thou serve. Now, how is he attacking his sonship here? Who did God give the, the honor that the world should worship? The son. You see, the Bible says, It is him that God the Father has sealed. You see, but the devil says to the son that should receive worship, come and worship me and I will give you the kingdoms of the world. What was Jesus bringing into the world? The kingdom of God. So the, Jesus wanted to establish the kingdom of God on the, on the earth, right? But the devil says, I already control the kingdoms of this earth. Just worship me and I will give you. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only him only shall thou serve. Now, you will find the relevance of this in the next one. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down and from thence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in, in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Who is the Lord he is tempting? Eh? Jesus. Was it Thursday I tested you on this one? So you know, already know Expo. Who is the Lord he is tempting? Jesus. So go back to the second temptation. Who shall he worship? The Lord your God. So who is the Lord your God? Do you get the point? So he wanted the one that should be worshipped to worship him. Do you get the point now? He wanted Jesus to sacrifice his standing with God just to gain the world. What he would have gained by dying for it, he he gave him a shortcut to it. How many times have you ruined opportunities simply because you took a shortcut? You just did, you, I mean, of course, you may just not know, but you, want to, you, you just felt that you, if you do it this way, the direction God is taking you will take too long. You just want to go, you want to cut corners. And then you cut corners. Maybe you never know, you know, the alternative for gone. You see that now. But you see here, 
challenging his standing. If you see it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, it's the same story. Maybe Matthew will make more sense in terms of sonship. Um, hallelujah. All right. So I, I want you to understand this, that I don't want to take it further from here. I'll just leave it here. And then we'll continue in the next session. Maybe I'll make it three sessions instead of two so that I can cover the ground that I want to cover. But the point is this. You see how that the idea of sonship is not novel to the New Testament. Yes, the, the sonship of Jesus Christ is a notch higher. It's, it's many notches above. But you see the point that if those other entities can be called the sons of God, how dare you contest the divinity and the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ? How dare you? Human beings, human beings who are called the sons of God, the children of God. God called them his children. They called God their father. And if that was so, and nobody contested it, how dare people, how dare we as human beings today contest it? That Jesus Christ is the son of God. Of course, my lesson is very long. But you see, if I will take you a bit forward to the end of this particular session of the lesson, you read in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says the sonship of Jesus Christ was validated with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now, of all the sonship that we have seen, the only one that got a proof that had validation of God himself, that God put his seal on, was Jesus Christ. And how did God do it? He raised him from the dead. So that's why you come to church every week, you hear about the resurrection of Jesus. The song that you sing, talk about his sacrifice, his death and his resurrection. Every time, because I'm deliberately trying to build a consciousness inside you. Even the song of thanksgiving that we sang, what was it talking about? The sacrifice of Jesus. Because you have to build a mentality about Jesus Christ. Let's read it. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. Usually, if you read it from just verse 4, it doesn't, it doesn't make contextual sense. But if you read it from the beginning, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning who? His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Verse 4, can we read together? One, two, go. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. How was he declared to be the son of God? By the resurrection of the dead. So God proved his own, he validated his own. Now, if Jesus rose from the dead and died again, he would have been like any other man. <laughs> Don't you think so? If God raised him from the dead and after some years he died again, like Lazarus. You know, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but Lazarus would have died again. He would die. What about that son of the widow of Nain? Eh? He would die again. Everyone that Jesus raised from the dead, all of them would die again. Of course they did. They died. But Jesus Christ, the Bible says, when it was time for him to return to his father, he levitated out of the earth. Do you know what that means? He floated away. He did not die. And it was not missing. There was no notice, lost, missing person. Mm -mm. They saw him. Let's read it. Romans, Acts chapter 1. See the validation of God. Verse 9. And when he has spoken these things, while they beheld, are you there? I want us to read this together. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Are you there now? Can we read together? One, two, go. And when he has spoken these things, I cannot hear you. 
Can we go again? One, two, go. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He was taken up. They were looking at him. I mean, they just had a conversation. If you read from verse 4, they had a conversation. And then they were looking at him like this. And he began to rise off the ground. And he floated into the heavens. Until the Bible says a cloud received him out of their sight. They just didn't see him again. Now, that was not the end of the story. Read verse 10. One, two, go. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Saying what? Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So they say he will come back. Now, in his coming back, he's not going to come in the womb of a virgin. Hello? In his coming back, he's not going to appear in the womb of a virgin. How is he going to appear? He said, in the same manner. How did he go? He, he floated away. How will he come back? He will float down back. Glory be to Jesus. He says, he is validated by power. By power. And that power started with his resurrection from the dead. And since then, he has always worked in power. See, he ascended to heaven in power. And he will come back also in power. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. But if somebody waits till that time to find salvation in Christ, it will be too late. Uh -huh. That is why we take our time to give you an understanding from the basics. So that you are able to communicate these truths to others. You see that now? If you don't tamper, if you don't have a problem calling the people of the Old Testament children of God, and the same Bible says it, they quoted God as calling people sons of God. God called them, his, he called the Jews his children. If you don't have problem with that, you should have no problem calling Jesus the son of God. In the next lesson, I'm going to show you how that Jesus really the son of God. And I'll provide you evidences from characters in the era of Jesus. Spiritual and physical characters. Human beings and spiritual entities. Speaking about Jesus as the son of God. You see, and not just did they call him son of God. Jesus went around validating his authority with miracles, signs, and wonders everywhere. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good, healing them that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. You know, the end of this story is seen in our identification with him in that sonship. That's the end of the story. That, that's why, I, you know, the title of the lesson is the reality of our sonship. That that state of sonship that he is now, not the one that was born of the virgin, the one that was raised from the dead by power, the one that ascended to heaven in power, the one that is going to come back in the same manner in power, that is the one we share identity with. Hallelujah. And that's why the Bible says we don't know what we shall yet be. It says, but when he appears, we shall be like him. Now, that is talking about the physical manifestation of what he is like. But before then, we manifest his power and glory here on his behalf. That's why the Bible calls us the ambassadors of Christ. You remember your memory verse? What did he call us? The ambassadors of Christ. And we are not just representatives. You know, if you, know, if you have a model, you know a model, maid. Eh? Eh? You know, yeah, or house boy, house girl, which is the more, more common one we use in our parlance. You know, 
You know, you can never treat an house boy or a house boy or girl as a son of the house. No matter how you try to pay power, you know, I, I mean, think of it now. Eh? Even if you bring the, you know, if you put someone that does not have at any level, let's say somebody that sleeps on a mat in his own house, now leaves that place, goes to a guardian who now provides a lush bed, lush one. You know, the first day they put you on that bed, it is likely that you will sleep carefully on the bed. <laughs> Why are you talking as if you don't know what I'm talking about? Have you been to some houses and when you enter, you felt like removing your shoe? Talk to me now. Have you not seen it before? Ah. In fact, shame will catch you. Because you, like, let's say the first time you went there, you saw a very beautiful place. And then you know where you are coming from. When you get to the park, you buy water. <laughs> you wash your shoe. You wash it thoroughly. Because you don't want to carry the dirt. Into, there was a day I went to, my, one, I went to visit an uncle with my, with my family. We went there to visit him. You know, we're coming from mainland. Let, let me just say mainland. It's not even mainland. We're coming from Ogun State. <laughs> so we are driven through all sorts of dirt. You know, and by the time we got to his house, his house was very close. It was just around Banana Island. You know, very posh, clean area, right? <laughs> you know, by the time you get to, by the time we got there, and, you know, they opened the gate for us to enter. You know, our car was different from all the ones over there. Because we were so dirty. Oh, God. You could tell where we were coming from, from the look of the car. Do you understand? And when we entered the house, now, I'm not, I'm not saying this to embarrass my wife, but that was what she said. So when she entered the toilet, <laughs> let me not miss Kota. <laughs> so let me not say what she, so I will not, I will not put words in her mouth. But she said it in such a way that it's very funny. You know, when you, you, you know, you can find amenities that you don't want to touch them. Like, they are too clean. Too clean. You know, the, the, the towel in the bathroom was the, was, like she said when she went to the market at some point, it was the highest grade of towels that were available in the market. You know, if you buy that kind of towel, you will not use it as hand towel in the, in the bathroom. You will not use it like that. <laughs> they put it as hand towel <laughs> in the bathroom. Do you understand? You understand the kind of, what, kind of stuff I'm talking about here? Yeah. You enter the house, you sit at the edge of the couch. You are just like, man. The floor was like glass. It was like glass. You are walking carefully like, eh? Like eggshell. <laughs> the TV was playing mirror. Mirror. You could see yourself right inside it. But of course, now, you have to use legal sense. Now, you know, this is a TV. Now, it's not just mirror. <laughs> and when he came out, he put on the TV. Pam. It was, the mirror changed to a TV. You know. That's what money can buy. You understand what I'm saying? That's the money answer at all things. Glory be to Jesus. But it's vanity. You know, all is vanity. Everything goes with this world. Vanity upon vanity. All is van. Now, we, we are not beefing those people who have them. <laughs> and if I have the kind of money, I probably will buy the same. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, but just know that even when you buy it, it is still what? Vanity. The clothes you are wearing is what? Vanity. Whether your own is 1 million, 1.5, my own is 15,000, or it's even boss corner. It's not, it's not boss corner they call it anymore. What do they call it? Eh? Thrift. Thrift. Whether your own is, uh, you bought it from a boutique or it's a um, designer. And mine is thrift from thrift store. It doesn't really matter. Both are what? Vanity. But I want you to see everything in the light of Christ. You. I want you to see everything in the light of Christ. Look at things. Don't, don't even look at your present circumstances. Do you understand? Because these things don't define who you are. Because with or without these things, you are the son of God anyways. Glory be to Jesus. You know, rich Christians are the children of God, right? Poor Christians are the children of God. And God will not treat the rich ones better than the poor ones. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So you have to be confident about who you are in Christ Jesus. Stand up tall. You know, when I, when I call you, beckon at you, come, come and speak. Do it confidently. Don't, don't say, Pastor, you should have told me so I can dress well. What are, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? 
What are you talking about? I don't want to ever hear it in your own mouth. That pastor should have told me so that I would at least look better. No, how did you see me too? As, as every day as anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there is no, there is, we are not impressing anybody. We are not here to impress anybody. We are just here to worship our father. Amen. And we are all acceptable before God. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Glory be to Jesus. Of course, if you can look very fine, look very fine, you know, right? Eh? But if you don't, if that is what you have, just be as comfortable in your skin as you are. Because God does not regard any man's person. Hallelujah. The only person God regards is Christ. And we are in him. Amen. That's why the Bible says we are the righteousness of God in him. Because if that in him is not there, it's zero. Like Kayo, they said, zero. Zero. <laughs> Amen. Glory be to Jesus. Father, we ask you that this reality becomes real to us in our daily walk with you. Our life honor your name. And we bear the glory of the man in Christ. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Say amen.